Uh, it's my pleasure to, to also introduce you. Um, Deva is a professor at the Robotics Institute at CMU and the director of the CMU Argo AI Center for Autonomous Vehicle Research. He did his PhD at uh, UC Berkeley and spent some time also in Oxford as well as at UC Irvine. His research interests span um, a wide range of topics uh, within computer vision and machine learning with a focus on visual recognition. He has received many awards, among others, for his fundamental contributions in computer vision and is regularly recognized for best paper awards. He has an impressive publication record in the relevant areas of both vision-based and also LIDAR-based uh, object tracking, segmentation, and detection. So we are looking very much forward to your talk. The stage is yours. Got it. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Cool. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Thanks again for the, the opportunity to talk. Uh, this is a, a great lineup of speakers. Um, um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I feel saddened that I couldn't be here for the, the upcoming panel discussion. Um, I think it would have been a lots of fun. Um, and then apologies also for not providing my title. Let me just sort of uh, start with it here. So what I talk, what I thought I'd talk about are, are some things that have, have kind of bubbled to the surface from spending some time um, in the world of autonomous vehicles, kind of as an outsider, uh, and then seeing how vision and tracking and uh, visual processing is used there. Um, and so the, the, the title I want to start with is, you know, Open World Multi-Body 3D Understanding from Videos. Um, and uh, a motivating uh, consideration, I feel like this has already been highlighted from, from previous talks, but let me just uh, try to set the stage anyways. Uh, one example I give, and I imagine this is similar to the salad example that Katarina gave. So, so my version of that is a, is, is, is a trash can that's fallen over in the road where there's lots of debris moving around. And you know, traditional pipelines for sort of tracking and visual processing would hope that you, I think you have detectors tuned for each individual piece of debris and trash you, know, you tuck them every frame and you link them over time and you track. And it doesn't seem like that's the right way of, of attacking this problem. Um, it feels like much more, uh, was, was, was far more important than naming the particular individual pieces of items there are sort of understanding where they are and what they're moving and how they'll move in the future. Uh, particularly when you think about this from the point of view of an embodied agent that's navigating in this world. Um, so, so, so how do we set the stage for this? Well, first, you know, our field is very data driven. So the, one of the first things we realized is that it, it seems like it's really hard to find data sets for um, open world uh, visual understanding. Um, and that itself is a very loaded term. We found that this is sort of hard to, um, you know, th there's very related definitions of what open world is, what open set is. Um, <clears throat> uh, and we instead went with the approach of large vocabulary. Um, one of the things that I personally find difficult with a lot of the formulation of, 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 of open world recognition is that a lot of times you end up having to um, simulate uh, a lack of data. You, you can ask the question, pretend I've never seen a dog before and I'm presented with a dog, how well can you process this image or video? And somehow that feels kind of artificial to me because I have seen a dog before. So instead, I think uh, a more reasonable version is just try to, try to collect um, sort of annotations and labels for as many diverse things as you can. And, and certainly this is not a novel idea. Um, in fact, in the image world, this is more well explored in the context of large vocabulary uh, image detection or Elvis um, or instant segmentation. Um, and so we could think about a, a visual analog of that for videos that we tried to construct. So a little bit of this is just to advertise that this data still exists and we hope people will start um, from, from the tracking world sort of start, start looking at it. Um, and you can, for example, explicitly answer questions, I think very similar to the form that Katarina was asking, which is at what point should semantics come into the pipeline? Should you recognize first that this is a purse or a bag and then link things up over time, making sure that purses link together and bags link together, but you don't switch between the two? Or should you first do something more sort of semantically agnostic, which feels more natural, um, but it doesn't seem like that's the way current pipelines operate. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> there's also this question of, I actually find it very intriguing, this problem of, of sort of tracking all objects. Um, you can see a, a, another kind of attempt at doing this in the literature and in, in these large scale data sets. Of, I think one thing that's sort of interesting and fortunate that's happening in, in the autonomous vehicle world is that um, a lot of industry is becoming data driven and willing to share data. Um, I think that's incredibly valuable uh, to sort of 
um, kind of orient some of the research questions as academics we could ask. So for example, one of the very really curious things that happens in industrial settings is you actually come up with very generic category names, um, something that is a pushable or pullable object. Normally in vision, we don't talk about this. Um, maybe the closest example of pushable or pullable objects, maybe it's better to think of as an attribute rather than a semantic label. But it turns out this is actually what, some of the things that you try to label in an industrial setting because you really want to know if something can move and um, how it, how, I guess how you, might, how you might interact with it as an embodied agent. Uh, ironically enough, all these red things are ignored in current benchmark data sets because I guess there's too, too few of them. Um, and this also seems um, somehow the wrong way of dealing, formalizing the problem. So I don't think that you're absolved of the need to recognize strollers because you didn't happen to collect a lot of them in your data set. In fact, it sort of feels like it should be quite the opposite. Um, you should try to work extra hard on finding strollers and tracking them. Um, okay, so, so sort of setting the stage for sort of open world a little bit. And there's actually a recent piece of work in ICCV that we have um, that I wanted to sort of get back to. But first, uh, um, I wanted to talk about sort of two, two mechanisms that we end up using um, to, to try to achieve a little bit more of this open world processing of video sequences. Um, and so one very, uh, I think very uh, uh, kind of salient observation is that this is one reason that 3D seems to be so nice. And I think this is one reason why 3D sensors are, are you know, a first class citizen in this world, because just by, you know, measuring depth using a LiDAR point cloud, you can tell that something is in front of you. You can tell that an obstacle is there and you can do obstacle avoidance. And so that's one of the incredible benefits of geometric processing. And this, this seems to give a very strong argument for thinking about video processing in this sort of setting purely from like, somehow from using 3D as a first class citizen. Um, but I wanted to give almost a contrasting view of that for a few slides. Um, <clears throat> and that is, you know, something I've always sort of wondered is, okay, how are, how are, people, able, how are people able to navigate? In particular, how are we able to steer things moving at 60 miles an hour, which from some, you know, from a biological perspective, you could argue we shouldn't, there's no reason we should have evolved to be able to do that. We're able to do that. Um, for that matter, <laughs> how is a rodent able to navigate? How is a fly able to navigate? It seems like, uh, I don't know if it's actually doing precise metric 3D reconstruction. I don't, I don't know if while I'm driving, I know the distance to a corner of, uh, of, of a wall or geometry. Um, so uh, if you kind of look at more of the human and biological literature, there's a lot of them suggest that motion plays a, a very central role. Um, and I find this to be super uh, sort of interesting and inspiring and somehow less explored in the, in the video setting for, for video, let's say video object tracking. Um, so in, in the world of motion, what I'm visualizing here is you, you can imagine that if you really want to make that a first class citizen, maybe the first thing you do is you take a video sequence and you compute motion estimates and in a, in a computer vision environment setting, that would be optical flow. So for every pixel, you record a 2D vector of where it moves to in every uh, in the next frame. <clears throat> now, what's interesting in the biological perspective, there's something else you can measure about pixels, which is not only how they spatially move from one frame to the next, you can also measure how much they expand or contract. Uh, do they get larger or not? And through very, very sort of simple sort of math of perspective projection equations, you can show that this derives uh, essentially um, a change in depth. It's a similar triangles argument and I'll show it a bit more in the next slide. But what's kind of neat about this is um, I'll, uh, so there's also a term for this in the, in the sort of human biological literature called optical expansion. And it's very well known that optical expansion essentially gives you time to contact, which I think is sort of an interesting phenomenon. Um, so the, the example I always like to give is pretend you are moving toward a wall and you could either be moving very quickly toward a far away wall or you could be moving very slowly toward a close by wall. Um, and in both those cases, you can sort of, uh, uh, sort of fix the scenarios to make, that, to make them have equivalent time to contacts. And so you would see the same intensity here. Um, you would see the same rate of expansion of, of a pixel. But in both those cases, they're very different geometries. One's a close by wall, one's a far away wall. And they're also very different 3D motions. In one case, I'm moving fast, in one case, I'm moving slow. Um, but it's kind of neat that in some ways this is an easier quantity to extract. And maybe it's even a more relevant quantity from like an embodied perspective of how I interact with the world that I see in front of you. The intensity here essentially, although it looks like 3D, if you stare at this for a bit, you can easily tell that it's not because bright pixels correspond to things moving toward you. So in fact, 3D things that are moving away from you look darker um, because you have a longer time to contact. Um, so one thought is that maybe we can actually think about this as a, 
as a, as a first class citizen for for low and mid level uh, sort of visual feature extraction. We all we already think of depth as a very important first class citizen. We already think of motion as a first class citizen, and this seems to kind of live in between those two. Um, so I use the term kind of three D ish motion, um, and you can just show by you know a very simple similar triangle's argument that the degree to which a pixel gets smaller or bigger shows you the ratio of how much further it's getting away or how much closer it gets. Um, so um, you can now build, uh, and, and furthermore, this is kind of an easy thing to extract because essentially it's looking at scale changes. So it's kind of remarkable that it's still essentially a 2D quantity that you're measuring how much bigger or smaller are things getting. Um, and we can kind of compute those with uh, relatively the same amount of accuracies we seem to be able to compute flow. Um, Okay, and so now armed with this this kind of I would almost call them you know, maybe two and a half D or two D ish measurements, um, you can ask this very basic question of uh, if you start with motion as a first class citizen, can I almost do background subtraction? Can I identify things that are moving? Um, and one of the the things that we first ask is you know let's pretend we just take a scene from a um, an autonomous vehicle, a car is moving. Um, can we tell? Um, can we segment out the moving thing from the stationary things? And if you look at this, this, uh, these two frames, hopefully you can tell that this this other van is actually moving toward us. Um, and, but we asked this question of like, how can we tell this? Um, and we can ask this uh, this kind of a curious thought experiment. Pretend you were given precise ground truth two D flow, so the sort of the the, the the classic, let's say, motion estimates you would compute. Um, we can ask ourselves: Is there a three D interpretation of the scene? That's, that's totally rigid where this car isn't moving. And in fact, there is, um, and you can show it down here. So it turns out that if you imagine that this car is really close to you and elevated above the ground, it generates the exact 2D flow measurements as uh, this sequence up here. Um, and this is a sort of also a relatively well-known geometric statement um, that if objects are moving parallel to the camera translation, um, then you can't actually tell if it's moving or not uh, because it satisfies that polar constraint. Um, but in reality, of course, we can tell that there's not a floating car. And I think it's because we essentially impose geometric scene priors. We think things have to be supported. So what that suggests is you need more than just, you know, precise like 2D flow or 2D motion estimates. You need to understand some constraints about how you think the world is, is geometrically formed. Um, so coupled with this analysis, we, we put this into essentially um, uh, a machinery for object detection. But instead of starting with pixels, you start with motion maps, either these flow maps or these optical expansion maps. And what you try to spit out is a mask. In this case, we used a particular object detector that was single shot and reason about masks in this polar coordinate frame. Um, but what it essentially spit out, as you can think about this is it's not a semantic object detector, it's a rigid motion detector. Uh, but you just train it the same way, but just given motion inputs. Uh, it turns out you can train this thing relatively well. Um, and this thing now is, is using purely motion as a signal. So there is no appearance that's built into this. Um, and now you can do things such as, uh, uh, essentially you can think about this as almost like a, like a neural take on, on multi-body structure for motion. Um, you know, can you build something that can segment out moving objects from rigid objects? And something that, that I didn't quite realize is, you, you might think that this is an easy task to solve, uh, but it turns out it's incredibly hard and in, uh, incredibly important to do. And one reason why is, um, if you can think of a case where there's a parked car and it's just starting to move. So it was parked before and now it's moving. So at some point it's moving infinitesimally slow. Um, so the difference between it moving and not is you know, arbitrarily small, but there's a huge impact in terms of uh, the resulting behavior that the that the embodied agent should do. Because if, if there's a parked car, I can go by it, but if it's moving, I might have to stop. Uh, so it becomes incredibly important to tell these very subtle motion differences between stationary versus park. So things like the analysis we showed a couple of slides ago turn out to be important and useful for that distinction. Um, the other thing it helps you with is that of course, this thing is just based off of motion. So it's not trained to find particular semantic categories. Um, and it can do things like, you know, you give it arbitrarily weird sequences and it can try to segment out things. Um, one thing to note is that this is just using two frames. Um, and one of the reasons we try to set this up this way is that we kind of you try to come up this with what is the minimal amount of information needed to do motion-based object detection. And so we almost needed at least two frames to generate a motion signal. 
Um, but clearly, if you actually want to integrate, you want to integrate over multiple frames to get more stable interpretations of the world. And I'll show that in just a couple of slides as well. It's just some follow-up work that we had in that direction. But one of the things this can do, for example, is let's say you have a, a video of someone riding a, an e-scooter, which is becoming more and more popular. We might not have enough, had enough data to build up, you know, special purpose detectors for these, but the motion-based detector actually works and segments out both the person and the, the e-scooter as one rigidish object which I think is actually a reasonable approximation um, for the setting. Okay. Okay, and so here's, <clears throat> here's kind of this fun application. Of, if you take these sorts of uh, tools that can build out uh, decent correspondences over, multi, uh, over pairs of frames, and now how do we come up with some, some, some sort of consistent interpretation of the 3D scene? Um, and here's a, a, a body of work that's very much led from a particular student, Geng Shen Yang, um, where the way that the tools, essentially the approach that he developed to coming up with a consistent interpretation of the scene is building a deformable model for the dynamic objects in the scene. Um, and so this I think is, is, is stuff that we're uh, super excited about um, because I think uh, in the past when I've seen these sorts of level of fidelity estimates, usually you needed either to have uh, very strong multi-view data, uh, something like almost like a panoptic studio um, or you need to have very strong priors. You need to have, okay, know that I'm, I'm analyzing a camel and I've trained on a thousand videos or more of camels. And in this case, what's kind of remarkable is that there's no training data. Um, essentially the approach that's done is it's pure test time optimization. So this works just as well for, a, um, in some sense, a camera or a person or a person with loose fitting clothing, which is also, I think, a notorious challenge here. Um, and so how does, how does this work? You know, at its heart, it's basically um, something that that is, I think, also you know, a, a very increasingly well explored in the computer vision, computer graphics literature, and that is essentially differentiable rendering. So most recently, uh, you know, the well-known form of this are you know neural differentiable renderers that are implicit, like NERF. But you can also, you know, there do exist neural, uh, there do exist differentiable renderers that operate more on explicit meshes, and so that's what really this work is is revisiting. Um, based off a particular differential render called soft rats. But uh, you know, given a video, and in this case, assume we have a video with input masks. Um, so these can be generated by something like the detector that I just showed in the previous bit of work. Uh, now, the, the model tries to build a 3D, uh, I guess the overall system tries to build a 3D deformable model of what's happening in the world together with cameras at every frame that now generate or render to something that looks like these masks. Um, and the same that I just said is actually also a pretty well explored topic. Um, and uh, the, the, the particular sort of, um, I guess, special sauce that we try to sprinkle on this is uh, instead of just starting with masks, we, all, we start with masks that give us some notion of sort of shape projections and motion estimates using the motion estimates we just talked about. Both these 2D estimates and these quasi 3D, mo 3D motion -ish estimates based off of expansion. So now what you get out is not just a 3D model, but it's actually uh, course, 3D correspondences, the little sort of trajectory trails. Um, and, and again, at its heart, it's really just hypothesizing 3D interpretations and 3D deformable mesh models and cameras such that when you project everything, it looks like shapes and motions that we see in, in, in the video data. Um, okay, um, I, I could talk a little bit about sort of the the things that that go into this that made this work. Um, and maybe I'll just sort of, um, if we have like 10, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just give a, a little flavor of what I think is, is some of the unique things that that uh, uh, Gengsheng developed that, that, that helped. So one is, it, it turns out in all of these, these sort of uh, neural synthesis models, um, it seems like estimating cameras is extremely crucial and a sensitive like linchpin. Um, so a part of, a really important part is being able to estimate for every frame of video, what was the camera pose? Um, and normally you might just, if you thought of this as a, as a classic differentiable rendering problem or analysis by synthesis, you would say, let me backprop into uh, six numbers that represent the six degrees of freedom for a camera. And what, you know, there's the, these six element vectors that exist for every frame. It turns out that this is uh, still very error prone and local minima prone. So one of the things that um, Kingston did was basically said, instead of backpropping into these six numbers per frame, let me define a neural net that takes as input an image from that frame and spits out the six numbers. 
And so now instead of backpropping to six numbers, I'll backprop into let's say the hundreds of thousands or millions of parameters of this neural net. So at first this seems like we've lost, but now we've taken this nice simple optimization of a few numbers and turned this into an optimization over many more numbers. So why would this help or why would this be easier? Um, well, one, there's this kind of well-known statement that uh, the first time I ever heard it was, was during a talk that Jan, Jan LeCun gave, where he suggested that if you have very heavily over-parameterized spaces, gradient descent actually performs better because essentially once you get to a local minima, that means that there's no way to perturb any one of your million parameters to get better. Uh, so having these very over-parameterized spaces actually might help uh, find more, more solid uh, solutions. This thing, if you think about it, adds this cool kind of bias that if two images look similar, they should tend to have similar cameras. Um, and one of the things that that helps with is that this is still being optimized in a batch-based gradient way. Uh, so you have to think about this is that one of the cool parts of the, these kinds of differentiable renders is you get to reuse all your PyTorch layers that are originally meant for learning networks, but actually now you use them for, for geometric uh, rendering. Um, but you, one thing that you make heavy use of is still sort of batch-based optimization. So at any point in time, you only have a few frames in memory. And you can imagine that if you optimize the cameras on these few frames, you, you might not, you, you know you're not gonna optimize the other cameras that aren't, uh, you're not gonna optimize cameras for frames that aren't in the current batch. Um, so it might make it really hard to make big moves. But in this case, because you're optimizing the neural network, you actually change the predictions for other cameras not in your batch. So you actually have the ability to make more, more, more large moves. Um, and then finally, the kind of uh, sort of neat observation here is that you can think about this really as test time learning of a category specific mesh. Um, so it turns out there's this huge body of work on sort of sometimes it's called unsupervised learning of category specific meshes. I think there was a, a beautiful sort of explosion of work in the past three or four years. You have a whole bunch of images of horses and you sort of learn the 3D horse model. Um, and all it has to be given is sort of masks of uh, it, these images plus masks. And what you can essentially do is just use all of that work, but just instead of applying it at train time, apply it at test time on frames of a video. And so all the tricks that they do and all the insights that they have, we can just repurpose for this problem of building models for the for never before seen objects that we see here. And it turns out that um, that actually ends up working quite well because um, right now you can't build a really good camel, uh, camel model because there's not a whole lot of camel videos that are available. Um, you can try to kind of squeeze in a horse model to fit to this, but you can imagine that taking a horse train model and running it on the video is not going to work well. So instead, we just train a custom category model for the particular object in this video, which happens to be a camel with two humps. Um, and that ends up fitting much more to the data. Um, um, the other kind of cool sort of technical trick here that um, uh, is something that I've always, I guess there's a philosophy of how do we listen more to the data? And one notion is we just optimize the models on the test data at hand. And one more trick that seems to be really useful is that a lot of these models for 3D understanding are based off 2D key points. Um, and, but normally, uh, let's see, uh, key points are really nice because we generate heat maps of, uh, for every pixel, how likely is it that it's the nose of this object or the hand of this object or the left ankle of this object? Um, and this is a way of representing uncertainty um, and um, I guess I'll, I'll sort of just give a, a little bit of a, uh, of, a, of a forward pointer of how to solve this is that ultimately what I would like to do is for this custom never before seen object in this video, I actually want to build a model of thousands of key points or even billions of key points. Essentially every single point on the surface mesh, I want to construct an appearance descriptor for and match that appearance descriptor to all pixels in an image. And it turns out you can do this. Um, you can do this in a continuous fashion. And the trick is, is you learn the distributed representation of appearance. So um, at, every, at every point on the surface object, you also represent, you make sure to spit out, spit out 64 numbers. You also learn a CNN that for every pixel spits out 64 numbers. And then by computing cross-attentional maps, you can tell that for any pixel here, I can try to match it to different points on my model. I can realize it matches best to this point on the model, but also matches kind of well to this point, the other foot and the head. Um, and also you can ask the same question, given a particular point uh, on the surface mesh, um, you can try to match it to all pixel positions. And so using that machinery, you can actually generate very long range correspondences. You're essentially using this underlying 3D deformable model as a, as a way of matching points and pixels over long range, uh, over long temporal gaps in a video sequence. Um, okay. Okay. 
So I assume, uh, to be fair, uh, um, how much, and Mark, how, how much more time do I have? Um, um, I think we can go a bit over time because there's a coffee break after that of 20 minutes. So we have some, some time. Um, okay. Cool, cool. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll sort of end with, with with two projects. One is very much in this in this flavor of uh, how do we deal with open world? Uh, how do we you know recognize things that we haven't seen before? Um, and so this uh, I just can't help but do shameless plugging. So this was a paper we had in ICV that ended up winning the, the honorable mention. So I thought it'd be cool to talk about this uh, just because I'm sort of excited to. And it very much deals with the question of how do we deal with uh, how do we recognize things that are in the open? And unfortunately, it's not specifically tied to video. This is actually looking at things in the image context, but let me try to give you the, the, the two minute sort of high level summary. Um, so the question that we tried to answer here is, you know, how do we find uh, pixels, objects, or even sensor uh, frames that are, uh, that, are in, that are outside our training set? Um, and why do we wanna know this? Well, in a very real sense, this is important for making, making a safety case. If you're going to run this on a safety critical system, you sort of have to know how often do I see something I've never seen before. Um, it can also be used actually for, for embodied actuation. So you might say, well, right now at test time when I'm running this in the real world, I'm encountering a scenario I've never seen before. And so I don't trust my predictions. I should pull over and stop. Um, and finally, another thing you might want to do is I still want to maybe use this almost within some active learning loop. So if I have training data that I can, not, I can understand is really different than my existing training set, maybe I'm more likely to sort of want to add it in. Um, so th this, this problem is by no means new. Um, there's uh, plenty of, of kind of open set uh, benchmarks to try to examine this. But one thing that, that we found at least was that it seems like they still a lot of times exist in sort of toy scenarios. So you can imagine that you train on MNIST digits between zero and eight. And now you think of the images of a digit nine as, as being open. And then you can sort of analyze the behavior of benchmarks uh, and different algorithms. Um, and then we wanted to sort of try to make this a bit more visiony. Uh, let's look at this through the lens of object detection or semantic segmentation. Um, and here's actually one, one kind of clear example of this. I sort of hinted at this before for some automotive vehicle data sets like uh, new scenes where strollers are actually ignored. Um, and this is not a this is not a rare occurrence. So cityscapes, which might even be a more of a mainstream data set that the broad vision community uses, also treats stroller pixels as ignored. So right now, if you train a model on cityscapes, um, it's actually it doesn't care what you predict on these pixels. And in fact, if you take a state of the art model and um, state of the art segmentation model and run this, what it ends up thinking that uh, ends up predicting the stroller is a motorcycle. And at first blush, you might think, well, that's not so such an offensive misclassification, but actually it could be um, because a lot of times you use these semantic labels to change how you think that these objects will behave in the future, the speed at which it travels, the, the, the chance at which it can be sort of volatile and turn on a dime. And that changes the way you move with react to it. We, we all know that if you, if you do see a stroller coming across the road, you should, you should have an incredibly uh, large safety margin. Um, Okay, so so right away, so we thought, okay, can we just turn this into a problem? It seems like we don't actually have to, um, like this this open set problem is already there in cityscape. It's just people haven't formalized it, and that was essentially one one little step. We said, okay, uh, we don't have to sort of invent a problem where we never saw the digit nine before. The current data sets we have, this is already an existing challenge, um, and the philosophy we took is actually pretty simple. And again, this has been well well laid out before, which is essentially if you look at a new image or a new pixel or a new patch and it looks different from something you've seen in your training set, then flag it. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, let, me, let me just sort of move, move, move on from there. Um, well, okay, I'll just sort of, I can't help throw out one more controversial claim just to make this fun. Um, you can ask yourself, you know, how should a safety critical ML system behave when it encounters something that it's never seen before? So one thought that it should general, the example I give is pretend you've trained a model on di different diverse weather conditions. And now you test it on a weather condition you've never seen before. So maybe you've trained it on like, you know, sunny days and rainy days and you test it on hail. So the model's never seen this kind of weird texture and, and noise. Um, and so one thought is that, well, hopefully you want your model to generalize to hail. Um, and so maybe one way of doing that is it computes features that are invariant to these changes. So maybe for some reason, the hail image looks like a rainy image. And then, oh, I, the model says, I know how to predict things on a rainy image. I should just keep going. But the other thought is it should raise a flag. But in order to do this, it seems like you would actually need features that are, aren't invariant to these appearance changes. 
You want features that are sensitive to these appearance changes so you can tell, oh, this looks different than what I've seen before. So this line of th thinking I always find super um, provocative because it almost suggests that safety critical machine learning systems should not generalize. Um, the extreme form of this is the only thing they should do is memorize. Um, and what this says is that they should, this puts the burden on essentially how you make this thing work well. You have to construct a rich training set that encompasses all the dom all operating domains you, you think you should, you should operate at. And anytime you see something outside that set, you raise a flag. Um, so I, I find this very uh, sort of a provocative perspective because it, I always thought of generalization as the, key, as the key task and the key challenge. And this says maybe not. Um, if you're trying to do sort of um, open world processing for safety critical tasks. Okay, so the, the, the real sort of approach that we, we take here. Um, so it actually starts from this wonderful, wonderfully simple and underappreciated paper from Microsoft 2019. It says, if you want to find open world images, um, uh, or if, if you want to be able to tell the difference between something that's in domain and out of domain, um, normally, you know, you, just even the way I formalize the problem, you might think that, well, out of domain, you don't have any training examples for, but um, they basically set this up as, well, pretend you do. So uh, pretend you have some examples that live outside of the K classes of interest, call them outliers. And they use this term outlier exposure. And then from this perspective, the simplest thing you could do is just train a classifier that tells the difference between the inliers and outliers. And maybe the outliers, um, it turns out this actually works shockingly well. Um, like, um, and, and the crucial detail is that you give yourself the chance to train on some examples of this. And that's much better than not training on any examples which oftentimes how we tend to formulate this kind of open world setting where you know, you're not allowed to train on dogs because that's the way I'm setting up the problem. And it turns out, no, 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 just train on a few dogs and that makes a huge mountain of difference. Um, but the problem is that those few dogs you train on, I don't know, they all might happen to be one breed because you only have three examples. And so you could overfit to biases. Um, so there's this other uh, kind of line of work that looks similar to this, which is um, a GAN where you just have uh, images from in this case, a closed set domain, and this is the real data. And you can try to synthesize fake data um, and then build a discriminator that tells the difference between the two. And essentially what we point out is that this looks awful lot like, like this. And so why not just combine the two? Um, oh, geez. Um, yeah, why, uh, why not just combine the two? So now you have some few examples of real outlier images, but then you also try to synthesize more examples. And what you try to do is you synthesize examples that fool the current classifier you have. So you end up training this generator for fake examples and this discriminator at the same time. Um, and what's kind of, uh, the, there's a final kind of important detail, which is because the goal of this is, maybe I'll, I'll start from this perspective. The goal of this isn't really to generate good fake, fake looking images. We, we, we're not interested in sort of the, the computer graphics that we did. We're interested in being able to tell the difference between in domain and out of domain. And because of that, instead of generating pixels, well, why don't we just generate features? So we, you know, we fix some state-of-the-art model that's being used for semantic segmentation or object detection. We think of the features that it generates. And now we just try to build a generator that also tries to generate those features. Um, and so from this perspective, even though this, you can think of this just looks like a GAN, I, I almost would prefer to call this, uh, instead of a generative adversarial network, this is a discriminative adversarial network. And what I mean by that is our goal is not to build a good G. Our goal is to build a good D but we're still using this adversarial setup to do so. Uh, and, and once we do this, we actually throw away the G. We're not, we're not really concerned with that at all. Uh, but then this thing turns out to be a pretty effective way of finding um, open set pixels. So you can identify things that are strollers or other weird, um, in this case, sort of makeshift temporary uh, shops that are set up on the street um, that also you want to make sure that you uh, can avoid, or at least if it's something that you really haven't seen before, uh, perhaps you go ask for help. Or, or add this to your training set. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm right at the end of time here. Um, and uh, the, 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 last com the last body of work that I wanted to talk about that I think I don't really have time for, um, essentially has to do with this question, um, very similar to what uh, Katarina was pointing out that, um, let's see here. Uh, maybe I'll just give you the, the, the two minute summary, the high level summary and leave it there. Um, so there's this wonderful observation that if you have geometric data, um, you might just be able to process it and almost have uh, objects and tracks emerge if you set up the kind of processing of it in a in a in sort of a, a nice, well-behaved way. 
And so in some sense, this is, this is building off of that with a maybe even more sort of provocative question, which is why do we even try to detect and track? Well, ultimately we do this, so we try to act in the world. Um, and if we think of the ways in which our sort of perception outputs are used by an actuator or motion planner, um, what we really care about is, um, uh, let's see, uh, okay, so traditionally when we think of like stacks for building up uh, detectors and trackers, we have to do a lot of manual labeling of what are the objects and tracks around me, where will they go in the future? But then um, one simple thought is um, we actually know uh, when we look at uh, LIDAR data, especially data that, that evolves over time, for every point that we see, we actually know that there's empty space between the, uh, the sensor and that point. So that's actually tells us how this object could have moved if the, if the world um, evolved the same way as it did, how it could have safely moved. Um, so in some sense, the, 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 the one sentence summary is perhaps you can just directly treat free space prediction as a task that a vision system should output. And what's kind of neat about that is uh, it turns out you can take a free space predictor, um, which doesn't require any semantic labels because in some sense, um, uh, green is all of this empty region. And you'd measure that just by measuring the depth value. Red is all the manual stuff that you want to label. That traditional kind of object, object detection and tracking pipeline spend a lot of effort doing. And the, the one sentence summary is, well, maybe green is enough because it kind of looks like the red. Um, th there's a whole bunch of things we don't know about what's happening behind you know, an occluded wall, but we, we do know the whole bunch of things that are green and this becomes free to use. So the essential thought is, you know, how, how is a planner being used? Well, a planner oftentimes is given a cost map of how expensive or what is the cost of moving into a location. So what we can do is we can say, well, if this moves into a location that we know is occupied um, or if, we, if it moves into a location that we don't know is occupied because it's hidden, um, that, that is a high cost. So it turns out you can actually use this formulation of what's empty and what's not in the future to help you guide where to move. and. Uh, perhaps the, the pro provocative hypothesis is that um, when you do this as a task, um, what you also find, this is a very simple task, which is just predict future free space. Um, what you find is that when you predict future free space, object-like and track-like things emerge as well. Um, and so here it's predicting a, a dynamic scene. So this is, relates a little bit to Alyosha's question of, uh, it seems like this is able to understand the difference between static and moving things. Um, because it's in the future, it's predicting a whole bunch of things will be static and a whole bunch of things will be moving. Um, and so uh, it, it, you can almost think about this as, we like to use the term colloquially, it's almost like a space-time nerf. Just like you can hypothesize a 3D world, you can hypothesize a 3D spatial temporal world such that when you project it into the observed LIDAR sweeps, it looks like the, the LIDAR formation. Um, this is very much in the spirit of what uh, Katarina was saying. And so the, the aggressive hypothesis there is um, uh, you can actually put this into a planner and show that you can use this to actually plan better. Um, uh, the aggressive hypothesis here is that maybe we can actually um, directly sort of revisit outputs that uh, could be more relevant for actuation and planning. Um, and then also could be more scalable because they don't require labeling all the explicit things that we tend to label, such as boxes and semantic labels. Um, so sort of the last sort of two minute summary. And like, I guess the first part of the talk that I really spent most of the time on is really this notion of how do we build open world systems that can analyze you know, diverse things that can appear in a video stream. Um, and really the, the two, hopefully the two take home motions that uh, take home messages there is that one is motion seems to be a really central cue that somehow is, seems to be underemphasized, I think in, let's say a lot of current architectures um, uh, motion. And then there's this whole kind of really, I think interesting and exciting world of neural rendering and differential rendering um, that, can, that can be bring to bear, uh, you can bring to bear in this problem essentially through the guise of test time optimization. You just try to fit models for the, the things that you see and all of a sudden you can, you can now process things like camels and um, uh, people on weird scooters and uh, other kind of contraptions that you haven't seen before. Okay, so with that, I'll I'll, I'll end. Uh, thanks, thanks again. Yes, thank thanks so much for your very interesting talk. Um, I think before we go to the coffee slash tea break, um, I think we can spend a couple of minutes to answer one or two uh, questions. Are there any questions from the audience?
case, uh, not for now. So let me ask you one. Um, the in the first part, you talked about how how you can fit these like meshes to to the um, to to the object that you observe in, in videos, um, given like some some initial mask est estimation. Um, do you think this could also be taken like one step further instead of having something like that you fit um, one mesh to like one object? Could you also um, do something like you have like record um, some some scene that is changing with like multiple objects, static as well as dynamic? Could you also then do something like directly um, for for multiple objects like at once? Yeah, no, that's a uh, it's a great question, and this is what we're trying to do with with this sort of stuff. Uh, this initial work on like motion based segmentation is this this would actually be about different mass for different rigidly moving objects. <clears throat> and so then the hope is is that now if you have this in a weird way, this requires solving some version of the tracking problem. Because if you have mass, I need to know this is the same mask for this object and the same magic for this, this object in the next frame. If you can do that sort of association, then essentially you have the kinds of outputs that are um, th that are listed here. Um, ultimately then it's just a bunch of, uh, here there's one color. And, and in fact, in the sequence, you might not be able to see it. There is another animal that's moving. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it'd be cool if we, we actually hooked up everything, you know, in its full-fledged glory, and we got out of the separate mask for this thing, and we were able to associate, you know, this mask to each other, uh, successive frames, and then it should be the case that this, uh, this, this kind of more modular thing, if you just not try to optimize for a three D interpretation of what's happening here, that fits with this. But um, I guess maybe the the more compelling view of this, could you really do this jointly? Um, and I think the the solution we have in place right now is much more uh, much more modular. Like you first infer this as an individual task, and now given that this is um, hopefully like high quality or good enough, then you then you move on to this. Um, then you move on to this. I'm sorry, you move on to uh, to this. Um, but we haven't we haven't put that together yet. But that's something that we very much want to do. Um, Okay, there's one question from the chat. Um, so if we encounter uh, a sample that does not exist in the training set, um, then you would just flag it. How does this strategy help us to improve um, our model? Yeah, uh, also a really nice question. So my, my sort of dodge in answering that question was uh, this thing. Um, so once you flag it, um, you feed that for labeling. Um, essentially that becomes an important example to add. Um, so it's one way to think about this is that I also think that uh, like in practice, one way to think about this sort of open world processing is that uh, it feels like it should really be part of a continual loop. Um, if you keep learning and then these, these rare things that look different than what you've seen before are really important for learning. Uh, you should pay more attention to it. Um, and so right now you can imagine, okay, then you feed that for labeling and put it in, in sort of a supervised learning setup. And then one more provocative thought from, from the, the, the last body of work is maybe you can actually do that without even um, uh, labeling, if you can really do this in a self-supervised way. So in that world, we argue that if you just have 3D sensor data, you can just use the sensor data as the target. Um, so, <clears throat> I guess one way of, of uh, maybe a better way to sort of answer that there is that you could use it in a traditional active learning pipeline for feeding it into a train set and then um, hopefully get letting the model get better because I don't know, a new one will be released next month or next year. Um, the more maybe interesting example is, could you just get better on your live sensor stream? Um, you can really do test time optimization, just keep learning on the data as it comes. Um, and so once you see something uh, wrong, if you can figure out a way to construct essentially a self-supervised label, then just start start optimizing on that that interesting thing. Um, okay. Um, 
thanks so much um, for being here and giving your talk. 